Oh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. Um, uh, and thanks for taking the time uh, to join us uh, from wherever you are around the world. Uh, my name is Brian Finlay. I'm the president and CEO uh, at the Stimson Center. I'm really disappointed that we don't have the opportunity to welcome you all uh, in person uh, to Stimson, but uh, we hope that that day will, uh, will come very soon. This is a kind of a fun opportunity for us uh, today to launch uh, a new book uh, by one of our own. Colonel Dave Smith is a Stimson Distinguished Fellow and he joins us today to release uh, The Wellington Experience, a study of attitudes and values within the, within the Indian Army. Just a couple of words of background as, as you may be aware for the past 30 years, the Stimson Center's South Asia program has studied uh, a wide array, array of uh, regional strategy, security dynamics, and provided insight, uh, valuable insight, to uh, policymakers in the region and, and really around the world. And we're pleased to add this uh, tradition of, uh, uh, add to this tradition rather of, uh, of analytical and policy relevant inquiry through the publication of uh, the Wellington Experience. The book uh, is the product of uh, what has been several years of really novel design, uh, research interviews, uh, writing, uh, workshopping, and I'm sure uh, what seemed like for you, Colonel, endless revisions. Uh, but now, uh, Colonel Dave Smith is, uh, um, I will say, uh, ready to launch. And, uh, and, and really, I think you'll agree by looking at his bio a little bit more closely, and I really uh, uh, encourage you to do so on the website. Uh, he is uniquely qualified, I think, to offer these insights, having spent uh, four decades in the United States Army. Thank you for your service, sir. Uh, he was with, of course, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, and much of uh, his time um, uh, uh, in the military, of course, was spent focused on, uh, on South Asia. So he brings, as I say, just uh, a remarkable wealth of, uh, of insights, to relationships uh, to, uh, uh, to this particular uh, uh, project. As I mentioned, uh, we're now proud to have him here at the Stimson Center as a distinguished fellow with our, our South Asia program. His book, uh, The Wellington Experience, provides, as I mentioned, uh, unique insights, I think, into India's uh, premier professional military education institution, as experienced quite uniquely through the eyes of U.S. students who studied uh, at Wellington over nearly, over nearly four decades. Now, obviously, given the, the current military crisis uh, on the Sino-Indian border, deepening um, uh, US-Indian relations, um, uh, this book really, I think, could not be more timely. We've made it available in soft copy, copy and, uh, and freely available on the Stimson website. You can access it uh, through the page for this event and also directly on the site, which is conveniently located behind my head here. And I really do commend you to uh, to uh, to have a look at it and and uh, um, um, and be in touch with us, be in touch with the Colonel, uh, if you'd like to continue this uh, conversation even after this event. And with that, Colonel, a big congratulations on uh, uh, on finalizing this. And I will turn the discussion now over to our South Asia Program Director, Samir Lalwani. Samir, thanks, Brian. Um, and thank you all for joining us here this morning, bright and early. Um, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to do this in person, but uh, hopefully we'll have a, a very intimate conversation and everyone will have the opportunity to download the book, perhaps even as we speak, uh, and pose some um, some questions and some thoughtful insights on, on the book and, and to all of our discussants. I have the privilege of just introducing uh, Colonel Smith and our three discussants are uh, uh, our luminary panel that uh, will be discussing the book and has uh, offered insights and reviews of it. And then we'll open it up to uh, a Q&A and discussion. Uh, so let me introduce the speakers uh, in the order they'll speak and then I'll hand it off to Colonel Smith. So uh, as, as Brian mentioned, Colonel Smith is a distinguished fellow with the Stimson Center and an independent consultant to Sandia National Laboratories on issues related to South Asia. Uh, he's the former senior country director for, for Pakistan at the Defense Department. He retired as a colonel after 31 years of service. During those 31 years of active duty in the U.S. Army, he spent 22 years dealing with political military issues on the Near East and South Asia, including two three-year tours of duty as a U.S. Army attache in Pakistan. Uh, a fun fact for all of those who uh, enjoy Steve Cole's um, fantastic writings, uh, Chapter three uh, of, of Steve Cole's Directorate-esque has a, a nice little profile of Dave, um, and I encourage you all to, to take a look at that. 
Uh, following uh, Colonel Smith, we'll have um, another Colonel Jack Gill uh, offer uh, the first round of discussion comments. He's an associate professor at the Near East South Asia Center, who's previously worked on South Asia issues, also at the Pentagon, a former U.S. Army South Asia Foreign, foreign Area Officer. He retired, retired as a colonel in 2005 after more than 27 years of service. And um, he is also one of, sort of our leading experts, I'd say, in this town in Washington, D.C., on the Indian military and the Indian Army. And whenever you have a question on uh, regimental formations or, or uh, you know, brigade and battalion sizes, uh, Jack Gill is your guy to go to. Uh, following his remarks, we'd ask uh, Polly Nyack, who's another distinguished fellow with the Simpson Center, to, uh, to offer some thoughts. Uh, she retired in 2002 as a senior government executive after a wine-raging intelligence career, a longtime South Asia expert. She was the intelligence community's most senior expert and manager on South Asia from 1995 to 2001, which was, as we all know, a particularly quiet time in South Asia. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, last but not least, we have Professor Amit Ahuja, who will offer uh, some more discussion uh, uh, insights, particularly from a political science perspective, uh, as, as our uh, resident academic on, on the uh, panel today. He's an associate professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research focuses on the processes of an inclusion and exclusion in multi-ethnic societies. He has studied this within the context of ethnic parties and movements, military organizations, intercaste marriage, and skin color preferences in South Asia. And I uh, got to know some of Amit's work on this subject as well uh, several years ago in a, in a, a workshop on um, South Asia security studies and uh, his work on the Indian military and ethnic politics in the Indian military is, is fascinating. And so I think he'll have tremendous insights to bring to bear on this conversation. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Smith to regale us for about 20 minutes. Um, obviously, you can't unpack the entirety of the book in that amount of time, but uh, he'll, he'll be able to sort of give us the top line insights from the book, and then we'll go to our discussions from there. Uh, and then uh, simultaneously, feel free to be submitting questions in the Q&A box below in the bottom of your screen. Uh, please be sure to add your name and affiliation as you pose those questions, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible in the Q&A session after the discussion comments. With that, Colonel Smith, over to you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and I'd like to thank uh, Brian and Samir for their, uh, their kind remarks about me and about the book. I hold in my hand proof that there is a physical book <laughs> and perhaps anybody that wants a copy can uh, contact Stimson and uh, we'll see if they can get you a copy. Uh, but let me get right into it. I have a very limited amount of time so I don't want to waste it. This book is being published, I think, for three reasons. First, it was always intended to be a companion study uh, to my first book called the, uh, the Quetta Experience, which was about the Pakistan Army and attitudes and values within that institution. Uh, but secondly, as uh, Brian mentioned, that there, because of the dramatic acceleration in the US-India relationship, particularly since 2014, and finally, because of three dramatic events that occurred in the last year. And of course, I'm re referring to the February 2019 terrorist attack at Pulwama that resulted in the tit for tat airstrikes, which marked the first time that two nuclear armed countries had uh, engaged in such provocative behavior with each other. Secondly, was the, uh, the May 2019 re-election of Prime Minister Modi and a number of decisions that have been taken since then by his government that perhaps call into question the future of India's traditional secularism and commitment to democratic norms. And then finally is the August 29th withdrawal of statehood from the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the lockdown and uh, the secession of political activity and everything that has flowed from that. So let's go to the first slide, please. Uh, I don't need to go into this slide. You all know the history of the universe. U.S.-India strategic partnership. The first 50 years were pretty fraught. The last 20 were a little bit better, but it is greatly accelerated under Mr. Modi. So the last four U.S. presidents have made a big strategic bet on India. And of course, that's based on the assumption that uh, India will be a bulwark against Chinese uh, military, political, and economic expansionism uh, in Asia. So the question is, is this bet warranted? And I have a number of questions on the screen that you can see that may be relevant in that. The problem in answering any of these questions is we have very limited access to the Indian Armed Forces. 
And so the methodology of the uh, next slide. So the methodology is the same as the Quetta experience. It's based on the assumption that the people who are best placed to understand the internal dynamics of the Indian Army are not so much our diplomats and our attaches in New Delhi as the US students that for an entire year or nearly an entire year work side by side 24 seven with three distinct groups of Indian Army officers. I'm referring of course to the senior officers that run the college, the faculty that teaches at the college and of course the Indian students. Uh, the methodology uh, was based on a number of structured student interviews, but it was augmented, as you can see, uh, by additional sources. Next, please. Uh, this is a brief outline of the book. I would point out that everything from the beginning down to the study observations is intended to be expository and as objective as I can make it without any value judgments being rendered. Everything from the study findings and below, however, are the subjective assessments that I have made based on the information that I was able to gather. You will note that there are 19 study findings and four implications for the US. Uh, I will briefly uh, show you what the study findings are and I will make a couple of comments uh, uh, in each area. So first of all, there are five lines of inquiry. And the first one is what I call the Wellington experience. It's an evaluation of the curriculum, the demographics and the social issues uh, surrounding the staff college. I'm gonna start by talking uh, about finding 1-1 and then I'll talk briefly about 1-4. So the problem at Wellington is the pedagogy which is the principles and practice of teaching uh, that occurs at that institution, which is characterized by rote memorization, regurgitation of massive amounts of factual data, much of it being trivial and irrelevant, uh, a concentration, at least in the army wing of this tri-service institution on the tactical rather than the operational or strategic levels of warfare, the inflex inflexible application of doctrinal principles and the discouragement of unorthodox thinking. A related problem is that there is an emphasis at the college on evaluating students for uh, their future contributions to the army, which interferes, of course, with the inculcation of a broad military education. And this is compounded by a pervasive culture of cheating, or what at Wellington is called the use of PCK, or previous course knowledge. Uh, we can get into that later if you'd like. But the thing that I found most interesting about uh, this line of inquiry was that for an institution that is purportedly to be a tri-service institution, the commitment to joint training, what in Wellington is called jointmanship, uh, is sadly lacking. And in fact, among the students uh, in a number of years, the standing joke at Wellington is that jointmanship is in Hindi is spelled A-R-M-Y. Uh, because the army controls the institution, there has never been a commandant at Wellington that was not an army general officer. The uh, major joint exercises at the institution are conducted in service specific cells and the final solution to the problem that is presented to the students is three briefings, one by the Army, one by the Air Force, and one by the Navy. And the school solution is that there is to be a process of joint deconfliction, which is never really practiced in the exercise because it always ends prematurely. Now let me go on briefly to the second line of inquiry, which is perceptions of external threats and friendships. You will note the very first one is interesting. It says that the high level of mistrust and thinly veiled hostility about the United States exists in the Indian Army. This is perhaps a legacy of the 50 years of fraught relations between our two countries that I mentioned. But what I would really like to address here is 2-3, which is the perception of China. 
And here there's sort of a curious reluctance at Wellington to characterize China as an enemy, even though it is universally perceived as India's main and an existential threat. And of course, in the past few months with what has gone on in Ladakh, uh, perhaps has gave, given some new potency uh, to this, uh, this area. So China early on was not considered to be a major threat to India. Uh, its economy was in shambles. And it really was not seen as a major threat until the late 1990s. And even then, there was a divergence of view at the college between the senior officers who were very much concerned about the growing threat of China and the younger officers who were still fixated on Pakistan and remained fixated on Pakistan for another decade or so. So as I said, there is a persistent reluctance to characterize China as an enemy. So why is this so? Uh, I would submit that it is because there is an, a relative lack of an emotional component uh, when dealing with China. It certainly exists when dealing with the United States and uh, certainly with Pakistan. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that of course, China has become India's largest trading partner and there are economic relationships that are in play here. And finally, there is perhaps an undeserved confidence that border disputes uh, can be resolved amicably, perhaps as the Dokkan incident in 2017 was. Whether or not, whether or not that remains to be true in the future uh, is yet to be determined. The third line of inquiry is perceptions of internal security threats. And this is a most interesting area. Uh, there have been four major militancies ongoing in India since independence. In fact, one that predated independence, and that's the one in Northeastern India. Of these four, arguably only one has been uh, satisfactorily resolved. And even that, uh, according to some scholars in the United States, uh, cannot be taken for granted. I'm referring, of course, to the Khalistan militancy that was settled after the uh, Golden Temple operations. So I want to talk now about number two, because I make the statement that the Indian Army ignores the most, most basic tenets of its own doctrines in Kashmir. Uh, India has a doctrine of subconventional operations, which includes a variety of operations below the level of general war. One of these is counterinsurgency, another is low intensity conflict, and the third is proxy war. It's perhaps interesting that the uh, Chief of Army Staff, General uh, uh, Rawat Bipin, soon after he took office in 2017, issued this statement about Kashmir. And I'm quoting him, this is a proxy war and proxy war is a dirty war. It is played in a dirty way. The rules of engagements are there when the adversary comes face to face and fights with you. People are throwing stones at us. People are throwing petrol bombs at us. I have to maintain the morale of my troops who are oper operating there. But if you look into the doctrinal information that is taught at Wellington, there is what is referred to in Star Trek terms as a prime directive for counterinsurgency or counter militancy. And that is winning the hearts and minds of the people. However, since 2016, uh, this tenet uh, of the SCO doctrine has been repeatedly ignored by the security forces in JNK. And I would argue certainly since uh, the events of August of 2019, uh, this has made the situation even worse. So I have little confidence that the Indian army is going to be able to settle an insurgency that let's face it has gone on for more than three decades and shows no sign of ending anytime soon. Uh, let me move into the fourth area, which is attitudes about the state and its institutions. And here I'm going to point out briefly the first uh, conclusion, which is that students were found to be apolitical in all four decades of the study, which actually represents a victory for Prime Minister Nehru, who was this one of the founders of the of the state because he saw the British Indian Army as an instrument of colonial oppression and resolved to take it down several pegs. And he succeeded in doing this. And all of those uh, chickens came home to roost in 1962 
uh, during the brief war between India and China, when the Indian Army failed to perform uh, very creditably. As a result, Nehru realized that he had gone too far and tried to right the balance. So what I argue in my book is that there is a de facto social contract between the government and the military in India. And the contract is basically this. The military is granted full autonomy and training promotions and other organizational issues. And the government keeps it at arm's length in major national security decision-making. Uh, this actually has ended up being a very good contract in the opinions of most of the students at Wellington. And even though the army does not participate fully in the civil military relationship, this is seen as a matter of pride when it is compared to what goes on next door in Pakistan. But I would say that in this context, there is a great problem. And the problem has actually been very well stated by an Indian defense analyst named uh, Anit Mukherjee, who sees the civil military relationship in India as entirely dysfunctional. Uh, and in this has displayed a lack of civilian expertise in the government on military issues and a ministry of defense that keeps the military under very strong bureaucratic control, but allows it too much autonomy in certain areas. And perhaps one of those areas is what is going on in Jammu and Kashmir, in which the army has played an incredibly active role in both policymaking and uh, counter-militancy operations. Now, why does this continue to exist? Mukherjee argues that the situation persists because most of the politicians in India do not actually believe that India faces an existential military threat, and therefore the current model of civil military relations is efficient enough to deal with the current threats. Whether that will continue to be true is something that I will address in my concluding thoughts. And finally, let's go to the last area, the fifth area. And that is attitudes about nuclear issues. And I would say it's incredibly difficult to really penetrate the screen of secrecy and lack of transparency that exists on this issue at Wellington and any place else in India. One of the things, however, that is taught at Wellington in its doctrinal materials that are given to the students is that Pakistan can be expected to use nuclear weapons against India if certain thresholds are passed. The problem is this, these thresholds are very ambiguous and Pakistan has made them deliberately so. So the problem is, why does India think that Pakistan will use nuclear weapons against it and yet takes no meaningful action to counter it? Well, I think there are three reasons. Or they, this attitude is based on three rather dubious assumptions in my view. The first is that, and I hear this all the time from my Indian military colleagues, well, Pakistan is a rational state actor and it knows very well that India will survive a nuclear war, but that Pakistan will be utterly destroyed. Therefore, Pakistan is bluffing. And so the second assumption is that Pakistan is bluffing about its threat to use short range nuclear systems against enemy army forces that might attack across the international border. And three, even if Pakistan is not bluffing, well, the sheer size of the Indian army will allow it to sustain high casualties and continue to operate in an NBC environment. That's nuclear, biological, and chemical environment. In my opinion, all three of these assumptions are rooted in ignorance about the effects of nuclear weapons, a subject which ironically was once studied in great detail in the 1950s and the 1960s at Wellington, but all but disappeared after the Indian nuclear test in 1974. So all of these five areas of inquiry are very interesting, but you may be asking, so what is the uh, implication for the United States? I think there are four. I'll talk about the first one and the fourth one. Despite the warm rhetoric on both sides, the US and India likely will never become true strategic partners. There's a legacy uh, of non-alignment in India that characterized the first 50 years. Uh, and more recently, there's an attitude of India requires strategic autonomy. 
and it can kind of plug in and plug out from the United States in certain areas of military cooperation, but it does not have to be uh, have a meaningful military relationship. In fact, the 2017 student at, uh, at Wellington really gave the best uh, example of the attitude in this respect when he said, the attitude prevailing at Wellington was that the United States is a country from which India can get great many things, but from which it does not have to give anything or to which it does not have to give anything. Uh, so I think there are areas of friction. Number one is this attitude of strategic autonomy and also a willing unwillingness of New Delhi to be Washington's cat's paw in any competition with China. There's also friction about the trade imbalance. Certainly that's uh, important in the Trump administration. And finally, there's a desire to retain close military links with Russia, which inevitably is going to limit closer military cooperation with the United States about concerns over technology leakage. But let's take a look at the last one. In any future war with Pakistan, India is likely to misunderstand Pakistan's nuclear red lines. I think it's almost inevitable. In any nuclear exchange with Pakistan, of course, Pakistan will be destroyed. It's a much smaller state, but India will be hideously damaged as well. In the book, I point out that there's a recent study between 10 very highly credible US scholars operating out of University of Colorado who have took, taken a look at the implications of what might happen as a result of even a limited nuclear exchange between the two countries. Uh, you know, there may be somewhere between 50 and 100 million deaths, but that's not the most catastrophic effect. Most catastrophic effect would be the environmental changes that would occur globally. I won't go into that in any detail, but we can talk about it later if you'd like. So anyway, India would be so damaged that it would be on, beyond the capability of the US or in fact, the entire globe to do the humanitarian damage uh, mitigation that would be required in an, even a brief nuclear exchange. Let me in conclusion turn to a final thought. And I'll go back to the question that was raised initially. Is India a strategic asset for the United States or a strategic millstone in the China competition? I would point out that Secretary of Defense Gates, Robert Gates, once noted that since Vietnam, the United States has a perfect record of predicting the next war. Quote, we have never once gotten it right. Is there any reason to think that India will do better in the future? I would point out that combat effectiveness is more than just the accumulation of high technology systems. It requires effective leadership, doctrine, organization, training, and logistics. One of my military colleagues on the US side, Lieutenant General retired Dave Barno, would add one more, adaptability. And he noted in a recent book on this topic that adaptability uh, is hindered by such things as flawed training exercises with predictable scenarios, artificial constraints that inhibit free thinking, and discourage adaptation and a military education system that reinforces homogenous thinking and suppresses openness to new ideas. In short, the kinds of things that occur every day at Wellington. When you add to that the own my own findings about uh, the pedagogy at Wellington the, uh, and the curriculum, all of which is gone into in great detail in the book, I would say that there is a huge problem that needs to be addressed. My fear is that the Indian Army officers that are schooled to rely on the Wellington solution may find that no previous course knowledge is available to provide the correct solution in any future war with either Pakistan, China, or both, and that unless it makes some concessions to flexible thinking, unorthodox thinking, and adaptability, the next war is liable to be a very difficult one. I'll Stop there. Thank you, Dave, for that very sobering assessment. Uh, now we'll um, have a series of discussants engage this this um, this book and the insights from it. So I'll first turn to uh, Jack Gill for for your thoughts. 
Great, thanks very much, uh, Samir. And uh, thanks uh, to, to Dave, to Stimson for supporting this project, to Dave for his diligent work. This is a great compliment to the previous uh, study of the Pakistan Staff College. Uh, as uh, always, I have to state that although I'm no longer uh, in federal service, I remain affiliated with the Near East South Asia Center, which is a government institution, but my remarks are mine alone and in no way reflect government policy. So please don't take me as speaking on behalf of the United States government. This study is stuffed with all manner of really interesting data and certainly well rewards a read. Um, I've been asked to talk about military doctrine and effectiveness, so I'll focus my remarks in that direction. But I would urge the, the readers and the audience today to keep in mind the where these uh, students are in the staff college experience, kind of at the lieutenant colonel level. And I try to translate that into my own experience of being at the US Army Staff College and how those two compare. So these are not decision makers, but we get a lot of information by looking at what they know when they come in, what they experience in terms of pedagogy, as, as Davis talked about, and therefore what that might mean for their future uh, in the Indian military or in the Indian system writ large. Let me start with two broad observations. Uh, the first is that perhaps that many, maybe most of these points that are made about the Indian military culture and professional military education or what the US in its acronym laden way calls PME. Most of these uh, that come through in the study of, of Wellington also apply to other South, South Asian states. Certainly in Pakistan as Dave's in-depth analysis of Pakistan's uh, counterpart institution will show. And these are things such as the unquestioning subservience to authority, lack of critical thinking, commitment uh, or a concomitant uh, drive for the school solution, uh, narrow tactical focus, often at a remarkably from an American perspective, granular level, uh, limited attention to intelligence beyond the tactical level, or at least at the tactical level, and form over substance. And of course, as Davis pointed out, the dominance of the army. The second broad observation is that Dave's study further provides evidence that to confirm what many observers have suspected about the Indian military for many years, uh, most especially the insularity of its three services, the lack of joint multi-service organizations, mechanisms, and perhaps most importantly, mental attitudes. And you can find lots of discussion of this in the Indian professional military literature. Inter-service rivalry, of course, is not unique to India but it seems to manifest itself in a particularly obdurate fashion among India's three services. And this is in no small part a result of the army's stifling dominance. And I believe Amit will talk a bit about the civil military side of things and disconnection and dysfunction. Dave's already met, mentioned Anit Mukherjee's excellent book. To this, we might add the unsurprising but troubling lack of attention to nuclear warfare. To me, the likelihood of chemical warfare in South Asia is extremely low, but nuclear use is horribly possible yet officers seem to receive only the most superficial training or education in effects. On the other hand, the consistency with which India's declared nuclear doctrine is described across multiple years is also interesting because that suggests that it is widely accepted as genuine and as appropriate for India among these officers at the, the, this very, very important level of Indian military education. So let me pursue the issue of jointness or what is called jointmanship in South Asia for a moment, given its centrality to military effectiveness and the fact that the certainly Wellington Staff College would seem a key institution for instilling such attitudes and thinking across India's services. Addressing the structural military cultural imbalance of army dominance is particularly difficult in India because of the ground services position that's deeply rooted in history and because it's directly tied to contemporary security requirements. So in the background, the British Raj, of course, was a continental power and British, the British Indian Army was an imperial force used for as a constabulary within the colony, but also as a holding force against potential external intrusion into the Raj and as an enormous manpower reserve for, for, for foot mobile infantry forces that could be used elsewhere in the empire and in European wars. So there was hardly any Royal Indian Air Force or Royal Indian Navy to speak of in 1945, 1947 at independence those functions were performed by the British. Independent India thus inhabit, inhibit, inherited lop, a very lopsided kind of structure from its very beginnings in 1947. But this structure also made sense in the early years of independent India because its threats mainly came from the North and the West or from within. So threats which a manpower intensive low-tech foot soldier army could address. 
The Indian Air Force was a useful adjunct and the Navy was large enough to show the flag periodically, but it was not a major consideration in the Cold War era. So that's all well and good. But India's situation, of course, is, has changed and is changing further. So this comfortable old army dominant approach is unlikely to satisf satisfy either India's own aspirations or meet its growing security needs. In the first place, it's not likely to suffice to meet India's uh, strategic desires for playing a leading role as a leading power on the global stage with the ability to deploy what Ashley Tellis calls at least a small subset of world-class military formations with significant reach and endurance. Second, it's unlikely to, to be adequate to meet the challenges of India's strategic changing, or changing strategic environment. Even if India accepted a second tier status, very unlikely, and did not seek to initiate change, its strategic environment is shifting in fundamental ways. And Dave's pointed out some of this. So those are gonna put pressure, those changes will put pressure on these old assumptions. The biggest factor here, of course, is China. Not only the material fact of China, uh, China's dramatic rise, but the manner in which it has pursued its interests have caused shifting uh, thinking in Indian security emphasis from Pakistan to China over the past decade. The emotional component Dave talked about, I think is important, but that's a, he's already stated that. And this has been accentuated for India uh, in many ways, what they see as a, an inimical to India, Sino-Pakistani collusion since about 2009, you can track the development of this thinking. With respect to Pakistan, India has sought to count new ways to counter terrorism emanating from Pakistani soil, but has yet to find any viable answers at acceptable levels of risk. Not to mention the many developments in the nuclear arsenals in both India and Pakistan that we can talk about if that's helpful. Furthermore, India's interests abroad have expanded significantly, most notably to the West, where it not only relies on hydrocarbon resources from the Gulf, but also has to think about the security of something on the order of 5 million or more Indian citizens in the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries alone. Finally, other countries, not to, uh, excluding the United States, as well as most Indians, they're looking for India to play a larger sort of net security provider term, if we take uh, coal and palace phrase, uh, to, for India to play this kind of a role in the Indian Ocean, if not more broadly. So these latter two strategic changes argue for some kind of a significant expeditionary capability, as hinted above, as well as close military interaction with international partners. This is problematic for New Delhi because these, old, the, these new threats and opportunities are additive to the old threats from China and Pakistan in the North and the West. Those remain. Indeed, they may now be even much more acute on the Northern border as we've seen in the past several months. From the evidence that Davis provided, however, at least up till 2017, Wellington has not recognized these shifts or has at least not catered to them in its curriculum as far as we can see. Sadly, in my opinion, uh, the Indian National Defense University project has also stalled. So that kind of calls into question India's overall commitment to responsive and innovative professional military education. So what are the implications for regional security? Owing to the low levels of jointness, excessively tactical focus and other features that Dave has outlined, India may not do as well as many imagine should heaven forbid some kind of a renewed war with Pakistan spiral out of an incident on the line of control or some terrorist action. The more likely outcome of a major engagement would be stalemate, at least over the short term, and all under the shadow of potential nuclear use. A crucial variable here, of course, will be how India assesses itself at any particular moment in a crisis and what courses of action military officers recommend to their civilian leadership. I completely agree with Dave's remarks about the inadequacy, indeed the danger of bean counting, tanks, guns, ships, airplanes, et cetera, as measures of military capability. Certainly important, but far from adequate if we wanna have a comprehensive picture. So I would add that the same applies to those who only look at defense budgets and what the numbers of rupees or dollars, uh, if you consider those in isolation from the sorts of intangible factors that this study highlights. So outside observers should thus be cautious in assessing simplistic and misleading headlines or so-called analyses that categorize India as the world's second largest arms importer or describe Indian military modernization as massive and therefore draw what to me are often erroneous conclusions. Implications for the United States, I see a great deal of opportunity for India and the US. I fully agree the US has to approach India, its strengths, its weaknesses, its peculiar characteristics, its history, our joint history with our eyes fully open, but I'm not as pessimistic as some are in this respect. 
it's neither the role nor the goal of the United States to urge any kind of professional military education model on India. A US model may not fit India and India is entirely capable of developing its own. But the US should certainly continue to remain open to exchanges between military educational institutions in both service to service levels and in the joint arenas, not just staff colleges such as the Wellington uh, School, but skipping up an echelon to the war college level, with defense services as a staff college up in or the, um, the college in, uh, in, in New Delhi, and then down to branch and technical schools and among the services. Indeed, because I see the great opportunity in US-India collaboration, it seems to me to be in the US interest to understand India better as the two countries become closer, but it is also, oh, by the way, helpful for the Indians to understand Americans better so we can work more effectively and efficiently together. Let me conclude with one final observation and before turning back to Samir, this, this study is a great baseline. It has to stop at some point, but it's a great baseline to evaluate future developments across Indian defense and the Indian defense and security establishments. The most recent data collected, however, of course, could not cover the most recent events, as Dave has pointed out. In addition to the changes in India's security environment that I highlighted above, we have India's recent joint military doctrine, the first time they published that came out recently, and so we'll see how that filters down in the educational system. There's the new US Indo-Pacific strategy in which India plays an important role. The re-election, as Dave pointed out, of Mr. Modi as prime minister, and most especially this summer's Sino-Indian border fracas. And here, I think we could very easily see a, a strong shift. I mean, many uh, very respected Indians and here at Stimson and elsewhere have talked about an, an inflection point in Indian attitudes towards China. So we'll see how that filters down to Wellington and elsewhere. So it'll be interesting then to see if those changes result in changes to the ingrained habits in the professional military education system. And if so, how those changes are set to adapt to the shifting defense requirements. So with that, let me again congratulate Dave on the completion of this project. Thanks to Stimson for the chance to participate in this event and for supporting the project and turn things back, Samir, to you. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Jack. Now I'll turn it over to Polly Nayak. Paul, you got to unmute. There we go. I assume I'm unmuted. Um, I, I also want to congratulate Dave on really an outstanding paper and to make a, a couple of um, additional comments on the methodology, which I really think is fascinating. Um, it's really an, an ingenious uh, methodology um, in the tradition of organizational uh, ethnography, in my opinion. So it, it looks in particular, just to repeat what both Dave and, and Jack have said in this regard, at how the Indian military perceives its own priorities, external and internal threats, international ties and capabilities over a very long period. Um, so uh, again, owing to the impossibility of getting information directly from Indian military personnel, um, Dave has used uh, the uh, intensive interviews with uh, U.S. military officers to get indirectly at answers to these questions, as he did in the um, 2018 study of the Pakistan military. So he is effectively inferring um, patterns of beliefs. Of course, the, the question that that would raise is uh, whether filtering through these views through American eyes uh, introduces uh, observer biases. And I think actually that the consistency of reported Indian military attitudes in similar time frames uh, should give us considerable confidence that these um, observations have been uh, substantiated. They, they're substantiable also uh, with by reference to other uh, studies of the same periods. Um, so let me briefly address some of the implications of the study regarding Indian relations with us, the US, China, and Pakistan. Um, many, many of the points that I think needed to be raised have already been uh, raised. That said, um, 
it's worth reiterating that starting in the mid to late 1990s, US leaders started to um, see India as a promising strategic partner uh, with shared interests in regional and global security and in offsetting China's growing economic and military power. Um, so the, the question raised by Dave is, is such a partnership with India a realistic goal for Washington? I think uh, for a country of its size, India's civilian government gives very little attention to military and strategy issues. It's very internally focused. I will leave that internal focus uh, on security um, uh, to Ahmed's uh, comments, um, but this is right on the boundary of these two sets of issues. Uh, the strong preference for multilateralism is an obstacle to uh, our having a truly joint um, strategic relationship. It, it narrows the aperture, in my view, um, for uh, a close partnership with anybody. Interestingly enough, India's national narratives also focus on India's commitment to peace and its cultural uh, history has some um, noble wars, but on the whole, any, India's civilizational um, self-regard is um, has been consistent. The, um, we've already talked about uh, strategic autonomy as the descendant of India's long history of non-alignment. Um, and of course, as, as both the previous speakers have pointed out, uh, the US insistence on uh, during the Cold War on Delhi's choosing sides was did not endear us uh, to India and still doesn't. Um, US wants clarity in the relationship and India still prefers a degree of strategic ambiguity, notwithstanding the publication of a, uh, of a, of a strategy doc, uh, document. The, uh, the single greatest grievance with uh, the US voiced by the Indian students interviewed by, by Dave uh, remains the US-Pakistan relationship. And this is an, an awkward and, and uh, continuing fact. The um, historical memory of past grievances with the US is remarkable. It's passed from one generation of, of students and for that matter, citizens, to another, and it is certainly fanned by media um, reports that focus principally on US stumbles and don't allow uh, new memories to take their place. The, um, the, the one that really stands out for me since I was actually in living in India, in rural India during the 71 war, um, it was the extremely strong memory of uh, 1971, when the US, for a variety of reasons, including a, a military pact with Pakistan, um, declined to back India's battle on the side of Bangla uh, independence, which resulted in the formation of, of Bangladesh. And um, so that, uh, that issue comes up again and again um, something that doesn't come up usually in uh, complaints by Indian military and civilian uh, researchers is that uh, Pakistan at the time was in the process of trying to mediate or act as a go-between with Beijing uh, in an effort under the Nixon administration to reestablish diplomatic uh, ties to China. So this is, um, again, there are aspects of this that get dropped in the uh, narrative of discontent. The disintegration of the Soviet Union opened new opportunities for a new start, but not that new. Um, and I, I think I have to agree completely with, um, with Dave, that there are limitations self-imposed by India on, uh, on what uh, can be accomplished in the way of jointness between countries. So as Jack has said, the Indian military sense of, of uh, its own growing global importance is somewhat out of sync with their antiquated strategy and 
resource limitations, which have been, of course, affected as ours have by COVID-19. And uh, Jack has actually covered uh, some of the limitations in the uh, strategic thinking of the Indian military. Interestingly enough, um, and uh, I believe Dave makes this point very well uh, throughout his study, is the fact that um, it, the Indians still see the size of their military as their major asset. And I was fascinated by the comment um, about the comments made about the size of the PLA. The PLA also is numerically impressive. There's very, very little acknowledgement in these comments about uh, China's growing technological age. I think uh, one of the clearest um, reflections of India's desire not to get entangled in uh, what some of the students um, interviewed described as US military aggression or bullying um, was articulated by former National Security Advisor Shankar Menon at a, a virtual Carnegie conference three weeks ago. Uh, he very bluntly stated that US and Indian policy priorities are not really aligned, and therefore the two countries should focus on issue-based cooperation rather than seeking a single overarching security structure. Uh, and then he, he's, he stuck it to us. Um, India is readier to act like an ally, but not in an alliance with the US. He pointed out very specifically that the US uh, no longer shares India's concern uh, with the security of oil and gas shipments from the Middle East, uh, which up to a point is true. And of course, Americans are upset as well by India's turn toward increasing authoritarian rule and Hindu nationalism. So China, uh, much has already been said about uh, India's uh, view of China as a strategic threat. I was fascinated working on this region, um, particularly through the 80s and 90s, uh, that China was always over the horizon. It was the next big thing, but it wasn't current. And so in many ways, India neglected the subject of China uh, in, in all respects and is playing catch up now. Pakistan, uh, we've already um, discussed, um, and we've also discussed some of the recent explosions uh, along uh, borders between um, India and Indian and Chinese forces between Indian and Pakistani forces. So China clearly um, will be uh, the major power in the region. But what's so fascinating is that as described by Dave, the scenarios for the Indian military involving China uh, went no further than, um, than miming the border incursions, which is well short of the actual threat potentially posed to India by China. One thing we haven't mentioned so far is the huge effect on India's willingness, mostly unwillingness, uh, to, to contemplate initiating a conflict of the Indian peacekeeping mission to Sri Lanka in the 80s which was disastrous and which has made Indian forces, Indian planners uh, very gun shy about uh, moving into any kind of uh, military role that where it is likely to see uh, hostile rejection. And that has very much molded, I think, the, uh, the, the Indian approach to the neighborhood as well as beyond. China is perhaps most irritating to India because it is vying with India for the affections of its littler neighbors. Um, in the mid 1990s, Indian officials could be heard saying that if only they had China's economy, they wouldn't be treated like a minor power. As Dave points out, by 2011, China was unambiguously seen as, um, as, as the India's major threat. Um, and uh, discussions began, although there was not a lot of follow-up of a possible two-front war because China was allied with, uh, with Pakistan. 
India, Pakistan, I, there's much that could be said, but much has already been said. And of course, what we have is a status quo power versus a revisionist state um, and uh, the uh, unfixed borders. The fear and loathing um, of Pakistanis has, if anything, grown over the years. And they have opposite national narratives. Pakistan, of course, portrays itself as the victim. And India uh, is outraged at Pakistan's use of military proxies across the line of control. Kashmir, in the view of many of the Indians interviewed by Dave, uh, is totally Pakistan's fault. And few uh, officers in the study admitted that India's military solution to what was originally an indigenous rebellion against harsh Indian rule in Kashmir might have something to do with it. So um, I was very struck by uh, one of the quotes that Dave includes in his study. An Indian officer who said India would not attack Pakistan because Pakistan has nothing India wants, although they will defend. And again, I think that India's reluctance to even contemplate taking, initiating military action is, uh, is very much still affected and molded by the Sri Lanka experience. It, um, Jack has talked a bit about um, the uh, buildup of nuclear arsenals, India's uh, size and conventional military strength have, uh, have shaped Pakistan's deterrent. We've talked about proxies directed and trained by Pakistan military, but never so acknowledged and allowing for some plausible deniability. And of course, the threat of nuclear use. So Pakistan has found its own counter to India's larger size and conventional military strength in subconventional and uh, threatened nuclear use. These two countries, as we, has been mentioned before, have fought numerous wars. The count is different depending on how one defines it, but at least 1947, right from the start, 1965, 1971, the Bangladesh War, and Cargill in 1999 which brought a moment of happiness in New Delhi uh, with um, Washington. When, uh, the, when President Clinton on the 4th of July um, in 1999 um, berated the Prime Minister of Pakistan in, his, in the White House for uh, having initiated this conflict. The Indians of course applauded. Ollie, can I just ask you to wrap up your comments? I, your I'm on my last sentence. Great, perfect. Um, the 2001-2002 uh, standoff, like the 2008 Mumbai attack, uh, were uh, initiated by Pakistani uh, terrorist attacks mounted by the militants. And that is certainly the scenario that we focus on most as the next likely spark that could ignite a real India-Pakistan war. Thank you, Paul. That's fantastic. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Professor Amit Ahuja. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Samir, for inviting me to this uh, really interesting conversation. Uh, Carlos Smith, congratulations on the book. Um, there's a lot of, lot of good work that's gone into this, and, and I'm sure you're very happy to sort of see this finally coming out. Um, I'm going to sort of stick to the charge that has been assigned to me um, my mandate is to actually talk about uh, sort of the domestic uh, politics, especially identity politics related issues that impact the mil military um, and, and, and also talk about internal security and a little bit of on civil. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to sort of see this conversation um, uh, that is occurring um, you know, among uh, the, the students who go from here, the officers who go to the staff college in, in Wellington, and 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 it's in one finding that Colonel Smith sort of you know, uh, you know did not really highlight, but is 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 startling and sort of it's uh, you know it takes center in, uh, in in the in the stage in the in the book is the fact that uh, you know when it comes to proneness to religious nationalism or 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 a tilt towards that, uh, uh, there is not too much being reported on that front in the sense that all seems to be well. 
Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting finding, especially coming from students or, or officers who've been uh, in the academy in recent years, uh, the period during which the BJP, the Hindu nationalists have been at, uh, ascendant. The fact that the Indian army has still remained largely secular uh, is, is, is therefore an interesting finding. What makes it even more interesting uh, to my mind is the fact that the army is still very substantially recruited from the North and the West, uh, which is where the BJP is powerful. So that's where its electoral strength is. And a lot of the army officers actually come from the regional caste groups, which traditionally support the BJP. And, you know, uh, so given all that, um, and given the fact, you know, something that I find in my own work on, on, the, on the Indian army, that religion actually matters a lot uh, to, to the soldiers in the army. You know, given, if you, if you consider these facts and then go back to that finding that this is still the officer corps uh, that, that's being reported upon in, in, in Wellington is still largely secular. That is, that is quite remarkable. Um, it's of course remarkable in, key, in comparison to what's happened in Pakistan. Um, Colonel Smith says that, you know, this is because the army sees itself as a class. I am not so persuaded. I'll tell you why. Because throughout the book, Colonel Smith reminds us that, look, you know, this is an army that still thinks in the, you know, in the way or, or does work sometimes, you know, that sort of goes back to the, to the colonial days or, or to the 1940s, 50s. But these are not the 1940s, 40s, 50s, or 60s, where you, the army can be completely separated in cantonment towns from the rest of the society. This is an army which is widely deployed in internal security. Every officer, every soldier has a cell phone. Uh, there is a lot of contentious discourse on, on television. So there is, there is no dearth of provocation. Uh, and, uh, you know, so what's going on, how the, how the army is managing to hold its course, uh, you know, this is, this is something that, that needs to be scrutinized and, and understood more closely because it may actually have very helpful lessons for, for, for armies elsewhere who find themselves in such similar situations. Um, I, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm happy to take questions on, on the, the, you know, the level of Muslim participation. Just very briefly, I'll touch upon that. You know, I, I, all the points that, that Colonel Smith makes are, are, are well taken, uh, but when we need to also understand that, uh, you know, the, if you, you know, besides the sort of prejudice-based arguments which are, which are made, you know, there is, uh, you know, there is an assumption in there that there is actually a supply of Muslims who are showing up uh, to recruitment centers uh, and, and, that's, and, and they are being sent away. In fact, what data, uh, you know, on, on, if you look at civil services uh, recruitment shows, that the number of people who actually sit the exams, who, actually, who apply, that number is low. So, so the, here the, the issue is not so much discrimination alone, but also that few people show up. Now, why that is the case is something that needs to be looked at more closely. Uh, I've spoken to Muslim generals in the Indian army about this issue, and they point to this. They also say that, the Muslim communities that the our military, colonial military used to recruit from all went to Pakistan. And so it's that, con that, that continuity sort of, uh, that, that, that there was a breakage there. And there is without a doubt, the fact that, you know, if you look at education levels among the Muslims, it is, it is really low. And because of that, you know, they are actually not applying or sh showing up for recruitment in, in enough numbers. So, uh, I'm not quibbling with, with, with what Colonel Smith is saying, but just saying that there is, this is a broader uh, story than just discrimination or, or supposed discrimination. Um, let me quickly turn to internal security. Uh, internal security issues um, you know, have been around and are something that the Indian state has worried about from the very beginning. If you look at the Indian constitution, uh, you know, territorial integrity was 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 something that was what was was a very salient issue, especially in the light of 
the violence uh, that took place around partition. Uh, that is that trauma informs India's understanding and, and view towards internal security. And the army got thrust into internal security responsibilities from the, from, from the beginning. Um, you know, it, it, it was used by, by, by the Congress government under Nehru. And then, you know, when the counterinsurgency, uh, uh, you know, operations started and picked up in the 1980s and 90s, then of course its role has grown. But the fact is that yes, its internal security role, role is very, very substantial. Um, I would argue that it, it distracts the military from its primary task of, of, of defending the borders. And it's, it's really interesting that uh, Colonel Smith reports uh, that you know, the, one of the students who when he conducted the survey uh, among fellow students at, the, at, at, at Wellington found that, the, that most of his fellow officers were more interested in encountering external threats than fighting internal threats. But uh, the fact remains that uh, the internal security role has grown. Now, there are a few things which are, which are important to understand. One, uh, uh, again, you know, we, we can draw conclusions about how the Indian Army has dealt with human rights issues, its, its actual performance in, in counterinsurgency. But one has to take this in the context. Uh, it's not the only one that's only institution organization trying to eat soup with a knife, as they call it. Uh, you know, if you look at the Sri, Sri Lankan army's uh, fight against the LTTE or what, how Pakistan has dealt with uh, the insurgency in the FATA region, there are, there are, there are alternate models out there. Um, but are they open, available to the Indian army? They're not. Uh, the Indian army has not used heavy weapons and air power uh, and against civilian populations as was done by the Sri Lankan army against LTTE. Uh, it, has, it cannot empty out an entire province or a state and then go in with F-16s and bomb the area to remove the insurgents. Uh, those options are not available. In fact, it's relied on small, small, small arms. Uh, it has, it has uh, you know, worked under certain constraints. Um, but that being said, it's been around in, in areas, in certain regions for a very long time. Uh, it's an army uh, of a democratic country. It, it, uh, it therefore has to ab abide by certain ideals and, and certain constraints. And so, you know, those, the, the, the criticism uh, is, 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 is to be taken seriously and has to be considered. Um, the, the, but if you look at its mandate, the mandate given to it by the civilian leadership in India has always been to control, bring down levels of violence so that the political process can be started. And in that sense, across all areas where we, we've had insurgencies, and if you look at the last two decades, the level of violence has just fallen. You know, in every region, if you compare Jammu and Kashmir also, which is the longest and the bloodiest uh, counterinsurgency um, uh, in India. If you look at that operation in that, that theater also, um, you know, if you compare the 1990s to the early 2000s and then look at what happens after 2010 and now, the levels of violence are just very different. So the same story repeats itself in the Northeast, in, the, in Central India. Bottom line, the army has actually been good at controlling violence. Where things have gone wrong is converting this low level of violence into political settlement. Now that, as you know, is not something the army can do. That is where politics should be doing a better job of converting uh, you know, these successes of, of controlling violence into political settlement. Um, the other aspect, when we sort of look at, you know, again, the civ mill aspect, I'm just going to quickly touch upon that. Um, you know, Anit's book on the absent dialogue is, is, is perhaps the best, you know, uh, intervention in this area. And I would recommend that. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm not going to say anything because I can't better that. But I will point to two things which, uh, which, which, should, which, is, which are worth looking at, um, you know, in, in a comparative sense. So if you think about the United States, for example, um, and if you think about civil military relationship, one aspect of it is the fact that uh, veterans 
are a part of the legislature. 20% here, uh, you know, the Congress is, is, is made up of veterans here in the US. Um, you know, you have, you have a military that answers to civilian leadership. It is revered, it's respected, it's an all volunteer force. In Britain, where the same situation is there, 8% of the parliament is, is made up of veterans. In India, there are hardly any veterans. Uh, so less than 1% in the parliament, and when you look at when you look at the data in terms of who stands for election in 2014 for example you know out of 8000 candidates in the parliamentary election only 28 were veterans so yes you know people may be joining the bjp or other political parties but you know they are not they are not in the parliament and that has an impact on the civilians understanding appreciation of the army's engagement both at the you know in terms of interstate conflict but also in, in internal security and the other aspect of this is that it's all very well to be apolitical but the the accountability mechanism that sort of keeps civil military relations in a healthy state is when there are debates on issues of of national security and where no one actor, political actor, owns the issue. Where we are today is that the BJP has come to own the national security issue. And an, on, a, an opposition which is, is particularly meek is, is, is especially weak on this, is on this one issue. And when, therefore, a government can, when a government cannot be held accountable, when you cannot have debates on national security because the governing party owns that issue so seriously, um, you know, that then has implications for civil military relations. Uh, you know, it's, so it's, it's important for the health of those relationships, uh, uh, for accountability to work in a normal routine way, where these issues of, of what the military is supposed to be engaged in, what it's supposed to be doing, uh, you know, what its mandate is, uh, these are debated uh, in the parliament and, 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 and we don't see enough of that uh, because of the ownership of this issue by just one actor. I will stop there and I'm very happy to, to, to take questions on any of these issues. Great, thank you, Amit. I'm reminded of something that I heard Tom Rick say about 15 years ago at the height of the Iraq war. Uh, which is a very similar point about sort of the declining representation of veterans in Congress really inhibited the ability of House uh, Armed Services and Senate Armed Services to really hold accountable um, generals in, in these discussions of strategy or acquisitions or, you know, um, decision making. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably kind of cuts across a, a lot of democratic states as well. So now um, I want to move on to the Q&A. We're uh, running down on time, so I'm just going to try to curate this as best I can. We have a number of submissions already made. For those of you who want to add your questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box, and uh, I will I'll draw upon them. The first uh, batch of questions I think really has to do with sort of the heart of this book, which is professional military education. So I'll pose three of them, then ask Dave um, to take a crack at it, and then any of the other discussions to follow on from that. So Walter Ladwig of King King's College asks, if India does finally establish a national defense university, does the quote unquote Wellington experience tell us anything about how it should be designed and structured? Uh, on top of that, Paul Sullivan from National Defense University asks uh, whether we have seen any change in thinking of Indian students who attend PMEs in uh, the US and the UK institutions, whether that has some sort of differential effect on um, their, their thinking. Uh, and then last but not least, um, Diana Weger of the University of Chicago and Naval Postgraduate School asks whether there's any observable difference in Navy and Air Force officers viewpoints on uh, any number of these subjects, including the security environment, uh, adversary, ally, et cetera, that diverges from Army officers. So Dave, I'll ask you to take that bundle uh, first, and then we'll ask the uh, discussants to jump in from there. Thank you, Samir. Uh, yes, what should the new uh, National Defense University uh, take from the Wellington experience? Uh, well, I actually go into that. You know, when I first started the, uh, the research on this, the new NDU was expected to open in 2018, and then it was supposed to open in 2019, and then it was supposed to open in 2020, and now I guess it's been pushed back into the future. I don't really know what the uh, 
obviously there are some internecine problems uh, about uh, getting that university ready to go. But really, it should stay at the strategic level. The, uh, the National Defense College that currently exists uh, is, is probably the best guide to a certain degree. Uh, the problem with the NDC is that it is, has never moved. It has never changed its enrollment. Uh, it, no more than 35 Army officers uh, and Indian Army officers are able to attend annually, and they attend too late in their military career for what they learn there to be of much difference. So I would suggest that the new NDU could, uh, does not really have to do a great deal with inventing the wheel. The wheel exists. What it has to do is create, uh, what the Indian Army has to do is create a, uh, a progression system where officers attending the National Defense University perhaps go earlier in their career rather than, uh, than later, as is currently the case. In terms of the uh, PME differences of the Indian students in the United States, uh, this is a very, this is fascinating to me. I point out that both in Quetta and in Wellington, there are really two functions for both institutions. And in, certainly in Quetta, the most important in, uh, of those functions is to identify the next generation of officers who are going to rise in through the ranks. And I think Wellington does the same thing. Uh, the officers who make that cut, and I'm talking about the top 10 to 15 percent of graduates in both institutions, typically what they do next in their military career is go to a PME institution in the United States, the UK, Canada, Germany, Australia, uh, or similar things, and they do very well. They do very well. They are not the problem. They can overcome all of the problems that I identify in both Quetta and Wellington uh, because they are great officers and they would become general officers in anybody's army, ours as well as theirs. Uh, the problem is what happens with the officers who don't make that 10 to 15 percent cut? What kind of an education do they get? Therein lies the rub. That's the weakness of the Wellington system. You don't go to war and fight with your top 10 percent. You go to war and fight with your 100% and you have to have a system that educates the average army officer in an effective way. Uh, so yeah, those officers do very well and they'll do well when they get back out of our schools. Uh, in terms of the differences between the Navy and the Air Force uh, viewpoints, I point this out in the book. Uh, I, I don't dwell on this a great deal, but I do point out that there are organizational cultures that are endemic to the Indian Army, the Indian Air Force, and the Indian Navy. Uh, typically, what I found is that there is far more conservatism and resistance to change in the Indian Army than exists in the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force. Uh, in terms of perceptions of the threat, the Indian Army is focused solely on ground threats, whereas the Navy and the Air Force look more broadly regional and globally in terms of assessing the threat. The Indian Navy, for example, has long been worried about China well before it penetrated the, through the Indian uh, Army's uh, level of consciousness. I'll stop there. Great. Um, I know, I'm sure other discussants want to get in on this. Uh, I'm going to pose another question and then turn it over to Jack Gill, who I think has thoughts on PME as well as this other question, which uh, comes from John Schisler from um, John Hopkins, who asks, has there been an improvement between the Indian military acquisition programs and actual uh, Indian military needs? So maybe Jack can take on a couple of those things. Thanks, Samir. Yes, and uh, uh, let, me, let me turn first to the Indian National Defense University that Walter asked about. Hello, Walter. Uh, this is a big debate. And so not just the fact that it's not been uh, actually, other than the stone, the foundation stone being laid in 2013, uh, there's a lot of debate about the composition of the faculty, the uh, composition of the attendees, how many from outside the military services, uh, would you have enough from the military services, uh, but also on the curriculum and how many schools. I mean, the tech, theoretically, the NDU would include the Defense Services Staff College in Wellington, as well as some other institutions. 
but there's a debate on that. And part of the problem that has stumbled, over which India is stumbling, is resolving those debates on what the content of the curriculum would be and uh, how the faculty, would it only be military faculty? How do you get civil, qualified civilians, et cetera? So that's part of the delay. Uh, one would think that could have been solved by now. The bill has been in the Lok Sabha from since 2015. But, um, but those are some of the challenges. I'll, over, I'll go past the one about uh, Indian students in the US that Dave addressed that. Differences in the army and between the army and the other services, uh, although one can't talk about it too much from the, the student experience, if you look at the doctrines, uh, the Navy's doctrine in particular is very strategic and very forward looking. There's an, in, an interesting recent piece that uh, Harsh Punt and a woman from King's College have written about the Indian Air Force doctrine. But the, the Indian Navy doctrine is something that could be applied to a Navy, any world-class Navy around the world. Uh, so to me, there you can find differences uh, there, Diane, that might be uh, of interest. And as far as, uh, as acquisitions, uh, this is a really long and difficult topic. Uh, although I disagree with some of the points made and, and some of the structure of the book, uh, the title, Arming Without Aiming, uh, in the book that that's, uh, Steve uh, Cohen put together uh, with his colleague, uh, pretty much sums things up, that there is not a uh, comprehensive uh, and certainly not a joint approach to military defense or defense service acquisitions uh, and, and tying those then to doctrine and strategy and, and that sort of thing. So there's a real challenge there. That's a whole topic all by itself that you know, we need another seminar to address. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I, there's a follow up to this that I think is relevant. So I'm going to um, jump the queue and put this question in. It's from Peter Lavoy. Uh, and he asks uh, the points about you know, the PME uh, training organization and equipping um, all, are all uh, convincing. So the question is whether India's civilian leadership sees this as a big problem. And if so, why hasn't it tackled the challenge with any determination or effectiveness? And I think uh, given that this is sort of a decision making political leadership question, I, I want, you know, everyone to, to try to weigh in on this, but let's start with uh, Colonel Smith. Could you briefly restate the question? I'm sorry, I was looking at something else. So essentially, if the points about deficiencies in, in PME, in training and organization and equipment are correct, uh, does Indian political leadership, civilian political leadership, see this as a problem? And if so, why hasn't it tackled the challenge with any determination and effectiveness? Okay, uh, sure. Well, I think that was actually very well addressed by Anand Mukherjee in his book. Uh, one of the problems is that the people, uh, the civilian side of the military establishment and the Ministry of Defense uh, are typical ICS officers that rotate from a variety of uh, of places in the government and they don't build any military expertise. And the second thing I would point out is what I called about the social contract between the military and the government. And the social contract, which basically states, okay, uh, Indian military, you can run your own schools, you can run your own uh, uh, promotions, you can run your own uh, internal workings, as long as you allow us to run national defense and national defense decision-making. So I don't think there's any interest on the part of the civilians to get in to something which would be a violation of that de facto social contract. Can I ask Amit, can you offer some thoughts on this as well? Just gotta unmute. Okay, I think you can hear me now, right? Can, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. No, so I, I take um, um, no. I think I think what what Colonel Smith just pointed out, you know, re, you know, sort of rehearsing uh, on its argument. Uh, those those things are true, uh, and again, um, you know, they're out there. Let me sort of point you to another reason, uh, and let let's just imagine a, a world where you know um, you know we have the you have these PME uh, de deficiencies. Your training schools are just doing an awful job of 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 you know preparing people. For the challenges that lie ahead, and you know, you have these officers who are then commanding units, um, and you know they're sent into let's just say an internal security situation, okay? And an insurgent group just overruns a, a region, or it just 
you know, it, it's not, it's just, it's, it's an insurgent group just establishes complete domination. Um, you know, badly trained officers are just, you know, we would expect, you know, this, this, that we, all we would expect given bad training are, 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 is one catastrophe after the other. And, and, and here is something that we need to sort of think about. I have lots of, I have lots of friends who, who attended the staff college and, you know, the, their, converse, their conversation suggests this, that look, sure, we have a curriculum uh, that, that puts us through certain, you know, so puts us through the paces. But a lot of the learning actually happens, um, you know, in, in the operational sphere. Uh, this is not in our military, which is sitting in the barracks. It's deployed, uh, whether it's on the India, India Pakistan border, India China border, uh, it's deployed in, in counterinsurgency ops. And a lot of that stuff sometimes doesn't even come back to the, to the, to the, to the schools or to the PME. Um, but a lot of learning does take place. Uh, you know, uh, standard operating procedures get upgraded, new processes get developed. So a lot of learning and, and, and educating happens there. Uh, the trick really is, and where this is, where things are really missing when we think about the, the Wellington experience or the NDU experience that, that's, you know, that's hopefully forthcoming, is how do you bring these lessons in so that you know, you're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, and because there is something to be said. In fact, there's a lot to be said for students, uh, for the next generation of officers to learn from the lessons that the previous generations have, you know, have imbibed in the operational areas. So, so it's not like they're, they're, so th that no learning happened. It's just, it's happening elsewhere. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, another set of questions uh, and then have um, Polly take a first crack at it. Um, so there's a question that was basically about uh, when Colonel Smith referenced uh, a potential future conflict with Pakistan and or China. And Jack Cuttis of the University of South Florida asked, could you um, expand on the term and? Do you see any evidence uh, the Army sees Pakistan-China ties reaching that stage. And this is kind of like a, you know, the question of the two front war problem. Uh, and I think everyone sort of has some thoughts on this, but I'll add to that a little bit more, which is on the, in the US national defense strategy, one of the reasons I think it was praised by a lot of people around town, even critics of, of uh, the administration and the strategy, uh, it was praised in part because it, it clearly and transparently identified where it was going to accept risk. And in a two front problem, or sometimes we describe a two and a half front, multiple front uh, problem, uh, I'm always kind of curious as to whether the Indian military, the Indian army uh, has thought through where and how it's going to accept risk uh, in that equation. So maybe, Paul, you could take a, a crack at that first and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave. Well, I think that um, especially in the OO years, the um, in Indian military and, and civilian analysts as well have thought a two front war involving China and Pakistan was at least a possibility. Um, I, I have seen no evidence that they have changed their curriculum and that might be something for, uh, for Dave uh, to talk about uh, to actually plan against such an event. It seems to me that what Dave is saying, and I'll let Dave correct me if that's not right, uh, is that they're still refighting um, in their theoretical um, education, their, their military education. They're still refighting old wars with old technologies and that uh, they haven't actually, in spite of their um, discussion of two front wars, considered how that might evolve. I'm, I'm prepared to be corrected on that. Okay, so, uh, good yeah. to see you, Jack. Thanks for the question. Uh, so the problem, you know, on, on the Pakistan, China, is there collusion? No, none that we've seen. Is there a plan? No, none that we know anything about. But, you know, in Pakistan, they always would tell me that the biggest mistake that the Pakistan army ever made uh, was not the 1965 war. It was not going to war in 1962 when India was confronting the Chinese uh, incursion in Ladakh. Uh, and they were, uh, the United States was very deeply involved in trying to convince Pakistan not to do that because at the time our concern was with global monolithic communism. Uh, but now increasingly you talk about a two, two front war, you talk about a two and a half front war, 
if you count what's going on in Kashmir, uh, which really calls into question the capability of the Indian Armed Forces. You know, I don't want to go into the bean counting uh, because I've, you know, I've already talked about that. But uh, you know, the uh, the Indian Air Force uh, requirement for a two-front war is 42 operational squadrons. They have 30. Uh, the, the Indian Navy's requirement for maritime control of the Indian Ocean region is something like 200 ships and, two, and 500 aircraft. They have 140 ships and 220 aircraft. They're nowhere near able to fight a two-front war. In fact, I think it's A.J. Shukla uh, who makes the point that uh, India cannot win a two-front war against Pakistan and China, and therefore the preeminent uh, or the preeminent objective of Indian foreign policy should prevent something like that from occurring. Uh, so I will just point out that there's a, there's a, there is an organizational problem and it's something that the armed forces need to come to grips with. Uh, you know, just as an example, in a war with China, the Indian army has been trying to build forces uh, to increase its capability along the line of actual control for uh, most of a decade. Uh, they're having problems building sufficient uh, force structure because of shortages of officers and, and recruitment of troops. And in any case, uh, as Polly pointed out uh, when she was making her comments, uh, if you go to Wellington and you start talking about an incursion along the line of actual control, it's usually in the context of a very minor operation involving a brigade or so. Uh, they're not, they're not wargaming what they're actually going to do in the event of a major incursion against China, much less one with Pakistan. We'll stop there. Okay, uh, we got a, a couple nuclear questions or, or maybe challenges. And since this is the Simpson Center, I feel it's incumbent on us to, to pose them and put them into the conversation. I realize that we are going over our official time of 1030. I'm gonna uh, take the prerogative to say we're gonna go till at least 1040 because there's just so many great questions here and uh, I'm learning a lot in this conversation. So please stick around if you can. Um, so the, the first nuclear question uh, is, you know, don't you think that the NBC uh, warfare is a hypothetical situation that India's nuclear doctrine, no first use itself, clearly educates um, the uh, SOPs for soldiers? Um, and then the second question, uh, or sort of more as a comment uh, coming from, uh, oh, sorry, that, that question was posed by Jagannathan of uh, the Central University of Jammu. Uh, the, the comment that I think is worth sort of responding to is by Air Vice Marshal Bahadur of the Center for Air Power Studies, who says that essentially, you know, it's the nature of, of um, the Wellington course, it's at a tactical level uh, of seniority, and that in fact, nuclear capsules are taught at mid-seniority mid officers of all three services later on in their careers, and he observed that he actually was also not exposed to sort of the, the nuclear uh, operating environment when he did the ACSC course at Montgomery, Alabama uh, in 1992, and so uh, maybe that's just sort of, a, a, I think, a point that maybe Jack made about um, it's at sort of at what level are the officers coming in and sort of what strategic aperture do they need to be engaged with. But uh, both those questions are, are sort of thoughts over to you, Dave, and then we'll, we'll ask some others to join in after. Uh, I noted that the, uh, the Air Marshal's uh, comment about being at uh, Montgomery, Alabama in 1992, you know, you have to put that in context. That was at a point in time where all of the U.S. military had lost its tactical nuclear mission uh, and the U.S. and the uh, former Soviet Union were in the process of greatly drawing down their nuclear forces. It was a time of optimism. I happened to be commanding a field artillery battalion when I lost my nuclear mission in June of 1990. And there's no army officer that really is, is uh, in the process of learning how to fight nuclear wars uh, at the tactical level again. So that's, that was then, this is now. So here's the point. The doctrinal material that is being taught in Wellington suggests that Pakistan will indeed use nuclear weapons on Indian forces that come across the international border. Okay, so you have to be able to deal with that and just saying that, look, we have a no first use policy and therefore this isn't ever going to happen is part of the problem in the fuzzy thinking uh, that I talked about earlier. You know, just because you don't want something to happen doesn't mean that it won't. The enemy always gets a vote. And as I pointed out in my Gates comment, you know, the United States has always gotten the next war wrong. Well, Air Marshal, 
What if you get the next war wrong and they do use nuclear uh, weapons against you? What are you going to do and how are you going to be able to fight? Well, by the time that happens, it's too late to figure out what you're going to do. Let me just make a couple of comments about the Indian Army. Now, all of the Indian arm, Army armored forces, uh, both uh, tanks and, uh, and armored fighting vehicles, uh, are mostly of former Soviet or now Russian origin. And they're equipped to fight and survive for a limited amount of time in a nuclear environment. The problem that the Indian Army has is none of its logistics and support units, none of its artillery or anything else uh, can survive in a nuclear environment. And those vehicles that I said are survivable, well, they would get one, one shot at combat, but whenever they had to uh, get resupplied with ammunition or refueled, or prepare for other operations, well, they're not gonna be able to do that because of the environment. The Indian Army doesn't have what we call mop suits, uh, mission-oriented protective posture, uh, you know, and they don't train in those. And there are no SOPs. Uh, I'm not sure what SOPs you're talking about. As far as I know, they don't exist. Uh, or if they do exist, they've never been referred to in any exercises. So no, I, I categorically reject uh, this notion that no first use is going to be a protection for India in a future war with Pakistan or China for that matter. All right, I wanted to give uh, Jack an opportunity to also address some of these questions, uh, but I'm gonna throw another one on the pile because it's a good one from Nick, Fi Nick DeFiore of the Joint Staff who asks, is the institution of the Chief of Defense Staff truly India's Goldwater Nichols moment? So maybe Jack, you can take on that and or any of the other questions that have been posed. Well, the, uh, the first question on the CDS is certainly, uh, it's a very, very interesting one. It's very timely and it's easy to answer because it's too soon to tell. I do not think it is yet India's Goldwater Nichols moment. Uh, it is possible, uh, you know, some things that uh, as an outside observer who's not an Indian, not, you know, just looking at things from the outside. Uh, some of the things that uh, General Rawat has said in his position as CDS, uh, regarding the Navy, for example, that questioning aircraft carriers, there's good reason to question aircraft carriers, but this sort of, well, that's not so important anyway, uh, might give one some pause. Uh, so I think it's too early to tell. It's not a Goldwater's nickel moment, but it is, it is a step in the right direction that many Indians have called for for decades. Um, on uh, the nuclear side, uh, at least I would expect, even if you don't ex intend to, for India to use first, that there would be discussion of defensive measures. And that requires study of nuclear effects, something beyond just sending messages to say, oh, by the way, we, we noticed a strange explosion off to our north five kilometers away. That you'd have to talk about defensive measures as a minimum, if not, uh, anything else in the nuclear arena. On China, the two front business, as I mentioned, since about, you can track to about 2009, continual reference, in fact, one could say exaggerated reference to Sino-Pakistani collusion against India in, in the professional literature coming out of, of all sorts of very interesting Indian think tanks and, and commentators. Uh, my sense is that, that there is a large strategy, which is basically hold China and then seize terrain on the Pakistan side in a, in a very sort of conceptual sense that you would then use to try and punish Pakistan while holding off China. Would India be faced with that situation? Uh, I'm not convinced that you would necessarily see that kind of uh, exercising and whatnot at the staff college level, possible, but to me, the absence of that doesn't, doesn't mean that the Indians haven't thought about it. Certainly it's been a topic for some years of the, the army commanders or army chief of staffs commanders conferences where they, some of the leakage that comes out of that has led to kind of strange interpretations in Pakistan, but it's certainly something the Indians has been engaged with, again, perhaps in an exaggerated way since somewhere about 10 years or so ago. All right, uh, so we're coming to the witching hour. I wanna wrap this up uh, by giving everyone uh, one last chance for, a, for one minute of comments, uh, final thoughts or questions that you wanted to answer, um, and then I'll, I'll close it out. So we'll start with uh, Amit. Um, so I just wanna sort of say that, you know, um, you know I think this, there's a lots and lots of very interesting lessons in the book, um, sobering lessons. Uh, and I think uh, kind of Smith has a little bit of tough love for those, uh, for, 
for for the defense staff college but i i very much hope that you know the the the, the conversations in the book are read uh, because i think there there are some very important lessons to be learned learned here um but i think on the whole my my general sense is that uh, india sort of is going to muddle along when it comes to its um, it, its pme uh, you know and but but i do see um some serious um serious concerns about some of the things that, that that people have touched upon whether it's india's ability to cope with the two external challenges from pakistan and and china i'm a little bit more hopeful just like jack about india's relationship with the us um and i think again i think it's a little bit early to uh, to to comment on two things one uh, how some of these uh, these defense reforms which are taking you know which which are which are coming into play right now uh, what their effects are going to be and also uh, you know whether the, the the army can can maintain its 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 secular ethos and also uh, you know not tilt politically um, i'm hopeful uh, but again you know these are interesting times thanks amit polly I would just say very um, briefly that I hope there's some way in which a sequel, or be it an article or uh, an addendum, could be uh, planned because I think there are so many valuable insights. Uh, we didn't talk about the uh, distinctions made by Dave um, between those who are. At, at the top of the class and uh, and those who are not. Dave spoke eloquently about the greater um, opportunities for those who excelled there and the, the function of uh, the um, of Wellington as uh, the selection of the, the top um, percentiles for for future duty. But I think it's very there are so many interesting angles to this that I would love to see a sequel. Great, Jack? Yeah, just I would uh, maintain my, if I hope I can call it, realistic optimism about the United States and India uh, and conclude by saying that I'm uh, very much share Amit's concern about the ability of the military to maintain a secular ethos if under pressure from uh, larger political and social uh, stresses. All right, Dave. I have a couple of quick points I would like to make. I mean, first of all, I want to make it absolutely clear, and I hope I've tried to make it clear in the book, that even though I've been critical of Wellington and the Indian military establishment for a variety of reasons, uh, I hope that any criticism that, the, that I have levied at them in this study is taken as I hope it is intended to be as constructive criticism that deserves a careful thinking. Uh, and to promote positive change in an institution that over the past 40 years I've come to greatly admire, and I do. And I share Jack's, I, I wish I could share Jack's optimism. Uh, but I'm from Missouri and we people from Missouri, the show me state, uh, frequently have to be shown uh, rather than just take at face value. So I would, I would like to end on this. For both the United States and India, our strategic challenge in the next generation is to find some way to come to grips with the rising military, economic, and political power of China. Somehow, we have to find a way to get past our mutual distrust of each other and work together in that common cause. So thank you all for coming. And I, uh, I would like to thank some old friends that came up on the net, Peter, Nick, Jack, Diana, you all know who you are. It's, I, I'm grateful that you uh, were able to tune in this morning. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll just wrap this up by saying, uh, please take a look at the Simpson website. You'll be able to find this book, The Wellington Experience, on there. You can download it, read it. Um, 
highlight it, mark it up, uh, and then come back with more questions and discussion. I just wanted to echo what Dave said earlier as well, that you know it's sometimes easy to mistake uh, these, these writings as some sort of normative judgments. And in fact, that they are our assessments of an institution in this case, which is a reflection of a strategic bet. And we at Stimson and the Stimson Center and the South Asia program take it very seriously to red team assumptions and be honest uh, in our assessments. I think this is what has allowed for the development of really deep relationships with, for example, Japan and with NATO countries. Uh, we have to take a critical eye towards the weaknesses and vulnerable assumptions in order to improve them. So identifying challenges is, is a step towards uh, developing improvements and solutions. So uh, I commend Dave on this fantastic work. Um, to all our speakers, thank you for joining us and to the attendees uh, who joined in this discussion and uh, we'll keep doing more of these and keep you updated so hopefully we'll continue the conversation thanks a lot